So good morning, everybody. It's Friday. Yeah, you ready? You ready? We're going to have some fun because we're going to talk about how to make measurements of isotopes on individual compounds, which is what I do for a living. Are you done? Because <laughs> she's like making me nervous. <laughs> it's the paparazzi. <laughs> You're just catching the, the vibe here, OK. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I've got, I've got the whole morning with you, which is uh, really exciting to me. It's also a long morning and a lot of material. So don't feel shy about asking questions or just raising your hand or engaging, because I, I really encourage that. OK, now she's gone. All right. so. <laughs> We have thank you cards, Jim. These are for Lori, Ming. Ming. Yes, so I'm going to pass. We want everybody to sign these. Not that I was trying to be rude to Lori, but we wanted it to be a surprise. <laughs> so, so there you are. Um, so does anybody recognize? Oh, I'm going to go to to this weight preset two, right? How do we do? If you're in the back, don't fall asleep. It's a little dark back there, so <laughs> I'll put the lights back on if I see you're nodding off. Um, do you guys know who these two are? Anybody? Muppets. The Muppets, yeah. Beaker. No. Beaker and Dr. Bunsen Honeydew, right? <laughs> right, so Dr. <laughs> This is kind of defines my relationship with my grad students, like Dr. Bunsen Honeydew has some crazy eyed idea and then hands it off to the grad student who's Beaker, and then inevitably Beaker ends up with his hair on fire, right? <laughs> so this is, so a lot, that's really to say that a lot of the accomplishments that Jim talked about are really um, the, uh, tied very directly to the efforts of the, of the students I've had the great pleasure of working with over the, the years. And some of the things I'll share with you today are, um, are, I'll try to highlight as I go uh, the students who have been involved with this, uh, the work. Okay, so this is not in your handout, but I added this last night as I was, you know, admiring the kind of organized style of our other speakers, and I thought, oh, they have outlines, I should have an outline. So, <laughs> so I added an outline. So this first talk is really the nuts and bolts of measurements of um, individual compounds using continuous flow techniques. Um, and so I've broken it out into four kind of sections. One is just a survey of the kinds of techniques and the basic principles by which we operate. Um, and then a little bit of an exploration of what I think are frontier areas in this discipline. Um, and then we'll, we'll take a closer look in particular at how GC systems work and how we can isolate individual compounds and send them in. This is really a, a wide, widely used technique, but not, um, but to really make the most out of it, to make your instrument sing, you really need to know some of the, it has to be more than a black box to you. And so I, my, ho my hope is to empower you with knowledge to make your own applications more successful. Um, the, the third section here is uh, on the sort of analytical limits. How small can we go? What's the limit of our abilities to make measurements? And that's uh, a tribute to John Hayes, who uh, was always pushing those limits and always trying to define those limits for us. Uh, John passed away in January of this year. He was my PhD mentor. He was Brian Pope's postdoc uh, advisor and really launched the field of continuous flow techniques and in particular molecular isotope measurements. Um, and then I'll just have, end with some uh, comments and some advice on how to handle uncertainty propagation in these kinds of systems. Probably all, some or bits of all of this you've already had through um, the two weeks here, but hopefully we'll kind of pull it together. And again, let me just remind you to feel free to ask questions as we go. So in uh, the middle of the 20th century, it was a heyday for isotope work. Uh, it was following not long after the Manhattan Project, which is a time when isotope research really um, was given a lot of federal dollars <laughs> for purposes of making, you know, destructive 
uh, applications uh, in the form of nuclear warheads. But as a consequence of that sort of general um, heightened interest in isotopic systems, we came out of that era with, an <clears throat> with a new set of tools uh, to make measurements. And the, one of the most important ones is the stable isotope mass spectrometer, which we're basically still using in that same design today. So it hasn't, some of the electronics have gotten a little better, and there's, of course, that whole thing called computing that we now can do. But there, the basic physics hasn't really changed. Um, one of the innovations that was developed at the University of Chicago um, and Yuri, uh, Harold Urey's group was the use of two um, uh, inlets with a standard and a sample. And you could compare the sample to the standard back and forth many, many times. And that defined many things about our field. It, first of all, is a differential measurement, so it neutralizes the uncertainties in each, and so you're just comparing the two, um, and that comparison is a difference rather than an absolute value. Right? So that difference is a much more precise measurement than an absolute value. And that was um, really opened up the field of stable isotope measurements as we know it. Uh, it gave us the delta value because the delta value is defined relative to a standard. Right? So that even the very notation that we use is sort of tied to this technological uh, development. This is the paper by McKinney. It was published in 1950. Uh, Yuri, as I understand it, I didn't know, know him individually or personally, but as I understand it, he, was, he thought it was a trivial thing, and why would we publish that? <laughs> but uh, it really is not a trivial thing, and it's a very um, meaningful thing. Well, what continuous flow has done for us is taken us away from using these dual inlet systems, and we now do very much a differential measurement, but instead of back and forth, back and forth, we do one uh, material, and then sometime later, we do another, and we make the comparison in time, right? It's across some period of time. In order for that to be possible, we needed more stable electronics, and we needed to develop uh, plumbing and uh, management of the gases that carry the material um, in order to accommodate the flow of, of helium or whatever carrier gas you're using. And that's been successfully worked out in the, starting in the 80s and on into today, really, these techniques are continuing to evolve. So instead of a two-armed instrument inlet system, we now have a many-armed instrument. And um, this is well, that's an octopus, if you don't know, uh, on the left. And on the right is another kind of octopus, which is we now have all of these different devices that can convey sample into the IRMS uh, through these continuous flow techniques. And I'm sure I've underrepresented the diversity of inlet systems that are out there, but these are just some examples. Octopuses are really cool, by the way, if you've ever studied them. They're really amazing, amazing animals. Um, but I digress. All right, so, and then here's what they look like. There's a whole fleet of them upstairs, so you've seen these all. This is just a picture of one at Penn State, but there's, the instrument is here on the lower right, and then the various inlet systems, there's three of them there on that particular uh, system. You know, you can switch back and forth between these things. So there's incredible versatility to the instrumentation, all again tied to continuous flow um, inlet systems. How these work is, as I, as I mentioned, really pretty straightforward now. <laughs> At the time, it was, it was some blood, sweat, and tears, but it, it's pretty straightforward in the end. And that is that you introduce a standard. I think I have a pointer somewhere. I have a pointer. There we are. So we introduce a standard at some time. We have uh, an unknown that comes in sometime later. And then you can, if you wish, have another standard um, after that. And instead of switching back and forth with a standard, you are s measuring your complete standard, and then your complete sample, and then another complete standard. So it's fundamentally different, but it provides that same uh, ability to compare. The trouble is that as a from this time i to time i plus 1, you've got some possible drift in the ability of your instrument to make that measurement, right? So the accuracy still can drift. Even though precision is always pretty good, our, our accuracy can drift. And so in order to do that, we take the standard value here that we measure and the standard value there, and we interpolate across that time period. And you just simply kind of, the software draws for you a straight line between those two values. And wherever your sample is, it picks the value of your standard at that time, and then it compares your sample to that. 
So drift is accounted for in, over this time period by this interpolation method. And that's buried in the software. You never have to think about it as a user, but it's good to know that if you have one standard that's kind of wonky and one standard that's pretty good, your, your instrument will use both of those values, wonky or not, right? So understanding what's happening can empower you to make good decisions about how to use the information. OK, so that's the interpolation method. This technique is, of continuous flow tech, uh, technology is applied in a variety of uh, inlet systems. Probably the most widely used, at least on the organic side, is not GC systems, but EA. EA system, there's way, way more measurements by EA internationally, globally, than by GC techniques. So this is really the most successful, in my opinion, the most successful of the continuous flow technologies. And so you've, you've been working, I think, you, who's worked with an EA while they're here? Anybody? Well, it should be most of you, I think, have had, or at least seen it. You know, if you haven't, go introduce yourself to the EA here, or at least one of them, there's several. And, and, because these are really important instruments. Just, they're kind of, they're, um, they're, they're really doing the hard work of isotope measurements um, in, in so many ways. So the idea is you drop your sample into an oxidative environment and that converts um, organic material to CO2 uh, and nitrogen to NOx. Uh, and it can also have sulfur uh, gases released. And then there's, a, there's a subsequent reactions that can take place. In this particular example, it's reduced copper, which converts NOx back to N2. And then you've got this mixture of, of gases that you want to analyze, and they're all on top of each other, so that's no good. So we separate them with a little GC system, a little gas chromatographic system at the tail end of this that separates the CO2 from the N2 from, from uh, the sulfur gases or whatever it is you've got in there. Right. So this is, this is a continuous flow technique, and it actually includes some gas chromatography in it, even though we're measuring bulk, bulk materials. So that's a very successful uh, device. To, and and the, the discipline for a long time was really driven by people who wanted to put big samples into their EA, right? That they thought this, was, this is good because then we can kind of get a representative number for this whole thing. Um, and I'm interested in going as small as possible. So we, we work kind of in the opposite direction of the trend that the the market was taking the instrument manufacturers. So we decided to build our own instrument where we could put in small, tiny samples here and then collect them uh, and then re-chromatograph them in order to get very, very sharp peaks of a small amount. And that's what led to our device, which we call a nano EA. This is actually not entirely, none of it is really new. And a lot of this early, uh, our work is based on early work by Brian Fry who um, uh, was doing basically this, but in an offline techno uh, technique. And we just simply plugged it into our mass spec and, and uh, adopted it for that. But the idea is your EA effluent comes in here, and you run it through a cold trap. You collect the gases for a window of time. And then you switch that flow so that it goes into a narrow and higher separation uh, column with higher separation po power. And then you can separate your CO2 and your N2 and anything else. And you end up with sharp peaks. So this is about five or eight seconds wide in peak. So that's our EA peak. Um, and this, is, this little chromatogram is, show, is the mass of 28. So we can see the N2 very nicely. CO2 also makes an ion at uh, mass 28, it's smaller. Um, and so just for illustration purposes of the timing, we just are monitoring that one mass. The actual 44 peak would be quite sizable, right? And so we can measure the ratios and make our isotope measurements of two peaks separated with um, uh, about 100 seconds of time, and they're you know, eight seconds wide. So that's a really nice separation power. And we're, we're currently partnering with Thermo on incorporating this design into their commercial product because I think the, the trend, the field is now swung back the other way and people want to run small samples. So, so that's something to keep in mind. And the kinds of small samples that we like to run in our nano are uh, compounds that we can isolate by HPLC methods, for example. And um, we've done a lot of work with chlorophylls and pigments that we can isolate individually by HPLC and then package up and send into our EA system. We've also looked at some intact polar lipids. We've done some work with that. Um, and then most recently, we've been working with a, a co, uh, coenzyme in Archaea called F430. So we can isolate that by LC methods and then run it on this system. <coughs> 